Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we'll be talking about jobs to be done, a research framework. I'm Sudipta Jyoti Prakash, a principal product manager with Amazon. A little bit about myself. Um, as I said, I'm with AWS today, and I've had about five and a half years of experience working for AWS, building products that I'm passionate about. I'm a developer by heart, but by mindset and by passion, I am a product manager. And I really enjoy bringing together technology and customer requirements together in the form of products, as I mentioned. And um, today we'll be talking about how do we best meet customer requirements through a mechanism uh, which is pretty popular in the market, which is called all the jobs to be done framework as such. And in the agenda, I'll be covering a couple of success stories of jobs to be done. Again, you don't necessarily want to rely on a research framework that's not well tested out or has delivered its own results. And jobs to be done is one of those frameworks where you'd like to really learn from those success stories, and we'll be walking through a few of them. The second is the core tenets of jobs to be done. So what are the real um, core areas and opportunities that you need to dive into when you're going into jobs to be done as such? I'll be walking you through some of the things that you need to keep in mind while doing the, the exercise overall. We'll be walking through an example uh, jobs mapping canvas um, this is something that I would have uh, spoken through as an exercise overall, but there are multiple canvases out there that you can uh, rely on. And these can also vary based on the industry that you, you're working on. And um, later, we'll talk a little bit about the growth track matrix assets. So here's where you connect the dots between all the things that you delivered through the jobs to be done framework into why it matters to your business. Why does it matter to your company? How does it help you deliver the right products and in turn improve the growth of the products and strategy that you have with your business? So really trying to tie the circle together in order to make sure that you're, you're able to hit the nail on the head when it comes to customer requirements and actually delivering what they need. I'll just summarize all of that uh, in order to ensure that um, if you have any sort of overall feedback or areas that you'd like to dive, in, dive deep into further, I could always go into that uh, in, in more detail. Uh, a quick fact here, um, one of the reasons why I picked jobs to be done framework is I've done a previous session on customer feedback. And this is actually one of the areas that I got a lot of response on saying research frameworks are something that uh, you would like to hear more on. So if there's any other areas that you'd like me to dive deep into further, I'm more than happy to pick that up for the next couple of sessions. Quick shout out uh, to Strategian and uh, Harvard Business School. Strategy in is actually one of the pioneers who have used the jobs to be done framework in, in, a, in a very executable manner, have actually transformed many technologies and companies uh, using this framework as such. And I'll be talking about a few case studies and success stories that are actually published by Strategy in. Um, Again, another shout out to Harvard Business School. Um, fun fact is um, Jobs to be Done is actually a framework derived by a Harvard professor that's evolved over its time in the market as such. And I'd like to sort of go back to its roots and actually look at some of the case studies there. And that's sort of what I've done in this uh, study today. Um, let's, let's begin. I'll start talking about some of the success stories. Um, to begin with, um, this is one of my favorite, DoorDash. DoorDash has actually stayed relevant in a complex and ever-changing market segment as such. So delivery services or online delivery services is something that's um, over the last decade become a very popular area for a lot of companies to innovate on. Um, in fact, uh, DoorDash is actually prefer is the preferred mechanism for customers to get their food delivered in the U.S. by 44% of the population, which is a pretty significant number if you think about it. A large share of their customer base um, actually rely on DoorDash to be their um, significant form of um, any sort of transactions, to be honest. Uh, recently, they have also launched something called Dash uh, Pass. And, and beyond that, it's called uh, Double Dash, if I remember that rightly. Uh, Double Dash essentially is a mechanism for you to even you know, collect your uh, orders from various restaurants while also making a trip along the 7-Elevens and CVSs of the world as such. Um, so they're, they're 
they've really done a great job actually focusing on what are some of the areas in which customers need innovation or what are some of the jobs that customers do on a daily basis and actually transform that into products or opportunities and services that they provide in order to better um, assist their customers, if I may. So they've grown from about $111 billion, pardon me, to uh, and, and they're expected to grow to $154 billion by uh, 2023 their market share as i mentioned is is growing pretty significantly they're i think uh, followed by uber eats who've made significant investments in this segment but um, don't see the same sort of growth curve um, that doordash does and um, it really is testament to how they have focused on the jobs that are required to be done by customers and really catered to them well I wanted to give a quick mix of different types of industries. And another one that I found was Cordis. Um, this is, again, another um, case study that's by a strategy in. Um, Cordis is essentially someone who is uh, struggling in the angioplasty balloon market. So healthcare industry and innovating there is a pretty hard uh, space to crack into. Um, they had dozens of areas in which they could innovate further on, and they discovered some outcomes that were um, underserved or areas of the market that were underserved and created products to address them. They actually released 19 of them in which uh, many of them became the first or second most popular in the market as such. Their market share went from 1% to 20%, which is pretty significant over time. I believe uh, their share price was pretty low and it went up to $20 uh, before Johnson & Johnson actually acquired them as a company. Or um, It was a pretty successful story overall. Uh, the full take on this, you, you could actually read that on the strategy and uh, website overall. But um, again, something where an area where they really innovated is to make sure that they built the relevant new products that are required for the market. And even if you look at the this as an example, you don't necessarily need one product. You can come up with a suite of products and release that to different market segments, and they can all be successful just by focusing on the needs uh, really clearly. Another example is uh, Crawl on, on Track. Um, this is a disruption story, if I may. Uh, Crawl on Track was essentially faced with an opportunity. Uh, so they, they were reflecting on some of the work that they've done in terms of their uh, legal uh, filing, if I may, when it comes to litigation processes overall. And they discovered that um, documentation across uh, legal industry is a pretty hard challenge overall, and they wanted to disrupt it using an electronic uh, document discovery solution overall. And um, they had already had a couple of um, um, missteps, if I may, and had two failed attempts in the market overall, but uh, they really, again, adopted jobs to be done as a framework, grew their uh, business from 11 billion to over 200 million, uh, pardon me, 11 million to 200 million in seven years. And they were also winning a lot of awards along the way, which is sort of testament to building the right products, right? Like you might have great customer track record and customer adoption, but uh, essentially being recognized within the industry as well as also testament to how well they have tried to sort of innovate overall. I, I like calling out this example because um, this is more disruptive of an area that they recognize to be an opportunity and were able to innovate overall. So uh, hopefully this gave you a quick understanding of what is the potential of jobs to be done as a framework and what it can mean to your business overall. I'll jump to core tenets of jobs to be done. And um, well, let's just quickly walk through the nine tenets so that it's something that you use as a mental framework overall. It's not something that's uh, like, you know, you need to go through the checklist and walk them, walk through them one by one. It's just uh, essentially making sure you understand the mental framework and what you need to do in order to um, get going with the jobs to be done canvas, if I may. So 
uh, some of the things that's important your people buy products and services to get their jobs done um it's kind of very simple and intuitive uh, but it's something that needs to really sink in while you're building your own products and services right um customers essentially think of here's what i need to do i need to go buy something from the grocery or i need to essentially um execute this task or even take a note of something all of these are tasks that they take or jobs that they want to do want to accomplish and you need to focus on those to in order in order for your products to be more um more well serviced to your customers overall uh, jobs are functional with emotional and social components to it so being very mindful of the setup in which the customer is in is super critical um a lot of the examples that you would read across jobs to be done especially in for example the manufacturing industry is where you kind of need to understand the situation the the customers in and that they might be in a lot of stress and you you don't necessarily want to give them eight buttons to actually deliver something or you want to essentially simplify the process for the customer through the emotional and the social situation that they are in so they are functional in in mindset as as well uh third one's pretty critical in my mind jobs to be done are stable over time so what what we mean by this is it's not something that they're trying to do transitionally you're not trying to do this as a work around you want to focus on the jobs that are important to customers and they do it iteratively and um you might think of this to be a small distinction between you know, what are some of the manual tasks versus what can be automated as well but the automation is sort of the product that you would like to be focusing on versus uh, you know just a small hack that you would do across a manual task for example so think of uh, what are stable and continuous that customers need addressed and then actually iterate on how best to solve for it the fourth one here is job security done is solution agnostic so um something that i can't iterate more on you know this is something that happens quite often to us a lot of our customers come come to us with here's how i want this product to be built but that's not where the task is it's actually a solution at that point and it's, it's what you need to get to is actually where the problem lies and understand the problem and the job that the customer is trying to perform in order to um, get to the solution that they are looking for and uh, um many times when you sort of look at a pool of customers who are asking you for different things you might also land up with here's an underlying problem which are all connected to each other and then realize it's a big area or an opportunity for you to invest in so um it's pretty critical to focus on the problem and the job versus the actual solution itself i'd like to sort of switch gears i think the the last four are in in its own category or the last five are in its own category because until now you're sort of thinking about what are some of the the guardrails that you want to have in mind before you start thinking about the process overall but from the fifth tenant you kind of like switch gears to how are you actually executing on it so success comes from making a job the unit of analysis rather than the product to the customer product uh, rather than the product or the customer itself so the unit of analysis is you're essentially not trying to go after here's a customer his job title is x y and z he's trying to um you know a business analyst who is trying to like come through a lot of data that that's essentially focusing on what the person is trying to accomplish rather than the actual workflow of the job itself so really focus on you know when the customer logs in as a business analyst what is the first thing he wants to do and you kind of walk through that job rather than it being the customer or the designation itself um, it's just a quick simple example of it but think of the job to be the unit rather than the person or the product itself um the sixth one is um a deep understanding of the customer's job makes marketing more effective and the innovation far more predictable um i think this goes without saying but a deep understanding of the customer's job right uh, that's the key aspect of it where um you're not just sort of superficially understanding like hey the customer basically just wants to go get groceries and come back but what kind of groceries why trying to do this what are some of the areas in which 
uh, or what are some of the things that they rely on in order to make that trip to go to the groceries? Those are the kinds of questions you want to ask yourself to be more effective um, in terms of the innovation that you're trying to go after. The seventh one is um, people want products and services that will help them get the job done better and and or more cheaply. And uh, I think the key here is, you know, to, to get the job done better and, and or more cheaply. Um, simple example uh, earlier on was of DoorDash. And I keep going back to sort of like go and get the groceries aspect because I think it's such a simple thing that everyone relates to. Um, you can go do that yourself, but um, imagine if you're cutting down the time that you go to the grocery store, pick up things and come back into by half uh, while you might be paying a little more for it. And that's sort of the trade-off that you do uh, when you're actually focusing on what the job is and how you actually uh, price the service as well. Um, something that we'll get to in the growth strategy matrix, but I'd like you to sort of be mindful of that aspect as well. Um, eighth one is people seek products, seek out for products that enable them to get their entire job done in one platform. Um, I think this is sort of very critical to keep in mind, especially when you're building suites of products. Um, um, a lot of SaaS-based services, a lot of um, you know cloud platform services actually do, do this really well where um, they think of the entire customer journey and actually use uh, various tools or capabilities as chunks of things that they'd like to uh, give it to customers in, in, in an a la carte fashion as such. The reason why you do the a la carte aspect is um, you may not have a customer use all of them and you might be catering to different personas, but um, having them all on a single platform really provides that rich, cohesive effect as such. And um, if there is a specific persona to whom all the jobs, all the various parts of the platform resonate to, then you're essentially getting the entire job done on a single platform. And that's that's really powerful overall. The last one, I think um, this is pretty critical as well. Innovation becomes predictable when needs are defined as metrics uh, to customers use to measure success when getting the job is done. So uh, really talking about the needs aspect of it, right? You kind of keep coming back to are defined as metric customers. So you want to measure success and ensure that the needs are met in a clear fashion before you go after solutioning it and sort of building a product around it. Um, hopefully that sort of resonated with you as some of the core frameworks. So it's almost like guardrails that you should keep in mind before jumping through the process itself. Because if you if you aren't in the mindset where you're thinking about more of the jobs than the persona or more of the, um, the why of it than the how, uh, it's important to have that mindset before you, so you start executing overall. So um, without a lot of delay, um, I'm jumping to the jobs mapping canvas. Again, this is an example of uh, a job map, again, by Strategy In. Um, they've essentially had, they've created a template out of it. And I'll be focusing more on what you see as the first eight categories. We'll def definitely go into the desired outcome aspect. But think of this to be a structure that helps you better understand the jobs that the customers are trying to perform. Um, the eight, I've kind of like broken it down as part of the cyclic, cyclical manner in which you would go about it. Um, first, you define it. So the determine objectives and plan their approach is um, you as the person who is doing the job, you're trying to under identify what are you going after today? And is there a certain run book? Is there a certain rule book that you're um, essentially taking into account in order to achieve the job? Um, you want to define that before you get started. And, and, and this is sort of where aim and objectives uh, really need to be very clearly, clearly um, allocated. Uh, locate is a gather inputs required to get the job done. And this can be you know, as simple as collecting a lot of data or trying to identify where are the areas in which the jobs need to be done. This can be a physical location, for example. So uh, here's where you're sort of understanding the where aspect while defining sort of the why. 
Um, the preparing is, um, you know, before you get this job done, set up and organize the in inputs. Um, think of it as if you're sort of like this data analyst, you have an objective in mind, you have a problem statement that you're going after, you know, and you locate where the data lies. And then you set up and organize the input. So you're kind of like making, make, you're making sure you're looking at the right set of tables, you have the right access to the uh, databases and so on. And that's sort of the preparedness that you need to go after. Uh, the confirm again is confirm everything is in place to complete the job. Um, this is again, sort of like a, a, a checkpoint uh, where while you've prepared everything, you just want to sort of go back saying, have I gotten all the relevant information in order to achieve the job that I'm trying to do? Because you might be set out to do a certain objective, but along the way, you might not have the right data or the, the direction of the requirement itself has changed. So confirm what you're going after and make sure that you have everything in place for it. Execute, again, um, seems simple, but execute and complete the job correctly is uh, critical as well. So um, once you have the relevant information and the relevant components as inputs, are you able to execute the, the job correctly? And executing the job is kind of like a process, if I may. Um, so we talk about it as, as a part of it to be monitoring as well. So you make sure that the execution is going on well during uh, the job being completed as well. So um, monitor the progress. And this can be, let's say, how long you took to um, complete the job. Was this the, the relevant amount of time that you intended to spend on it? Um, the, the relevant inputs, uh, the relevant requirements that you put into place, were they actually uh, met accurately at the end? All of that is sort of the, the, the aspects of monitoring that you need to keep in mind. The modify um, is sort of this next step. If monitoring indicates a problem, adjust to fix it. So here again, so as a data analyst, you might have gotten access to certain sets of data, but now you realize that uh, this might not be enough or you need a further level of granularity that you don't necessarily uh, have today as yes, that. So um, you, you might need to adjust your inputs. You might might unfortunately also be updating your goal that you set out to achieve through your defined process and so on. That's sort of the modify aspect of it. Uh, conclude again, clean up, dispose. Um, we even say supplies here because there are jobs that are more physical and it might be, let's say, um, a lab equipment that you need to uh, complete and clean up as such. Um, those are the things that you need to do in order to end the job overall. So think of this to be sort of a cycle that you would have to uh, complete. And uh, this is a good way to look at it, um, a different uh, mind map where they talk, talk about the job map canvas to be in three categories. One is the preparation aspect, then the execution aspect and the conclusion, because um, the preparation really just sets you up for better success in the execution. And the conclusion um, happens to help you understand if you achieved what you were set out to, or you at least concluded the right set of um, job activities after modifying any changes that you would like to as part of your execution plan overall. Again, going back to this framework, uh, the reason why I sort of come back to it is they have a really good um, a strategy and have a really good view of why this canvas matters. Um, the desired outcome section that you can see below it essentially is an aftermath of how you use what you would have identified as part of the job mapping canvas to why it matters to your um, to your organization. Excuse me again. So I'm going to jump into growth strategy matrix here, which is essentially a focus into uh, the the areas which come as an aftermath of your jobs to be done uh, exercise. So once you identify the job, you you have to take a step back and identify um, what is the opportunity that you have in hand and uh, how would that product essentially be successful in the market based on what you know of the job. So there are five different strategies that you could take in order to, to propel growth for your organization. So and 
based on the job and what you identify as an opportunity opportunity from it pardon me you will be able to place yourself into e- either of these quadrants or or, or for either one of those quadrants plus the sustaining strategy aspects of it and i'll come back to how um, they have also highlighted some aspects of uh, monetization so charging less versus charging more or get the job done better versus worse um you know just w- ways in which you can think about how your product needs to be positioned and priced as an outcome of the strategy that you choose so the first one is the differentiated strategy where a differentiated strategy is effectively when target customer at a population that's underserved and willing to pay more to get the job done so um i think it it kind of speaks for itself where you're saying you found something that's underserved something that um customers identify as a need and think okay i'm willing to pay a few extra bucks to get it done and you just go ahead and try to simply simply solve for it right and um this actually can be disruptive in many ways as well so i'll i'll, I'll pick another example here which is netflix who essentially looked at a market which said uh, customers are willing to pay to watch movies um, but they're underserved by having to look at each one of the choices themselves go ahead and go to a kiosk and get the right cd or relevant disc in order to watch a movie why don't i make that a simpler process by giving a streaming services which have all of the options in a single platform that's sort of where you identify the opportunity understood that the market is underserved and you know that customers are willing to pay for it so they defined that to be a differentiated strategy and worked from there a dominant strategy is where a dominant requires a solution that gets the job done better and more cheaply so you have seen a couple of players in this market who have identified the opportunity but needs to be up level a bit and uh, perhaps for you to remain competitive needs to be done cheaply as well and this really depends on the type of situation uh, to be honest but uh, think of it to be uh, an already slightly crowded market but um, there is a lot of opportunity for you to do things better overall so pursuing such strategy is nearly always effective as it targets both underserved and overserved customer segments and um, non consumers as well so here you you might actually be looking at um, as they say underserved and overserved customer segments while also another critical part is um there is transfer of users from already existing products overall so you have non consumers and customers who are coming in from different products overall so um what this strategy focuses on is an area that's already been identified as an opportunity but you're just trying to do better with it So the next one is a disruptive strategy. A uh, disruptive strategy is effectively when you're targeting a customer population that's overserved and not willing to pay more to get the job done. So it's a really tricky position to be at as where there are so many more options that that's out there for the customer and the customer is not willing to pay more for the same service or similar service as such. And uh, here is sort of where the angle of disruption comes in because you just don't want to do simply better than what everyone else is doing because uh there is more there's not a lot of likely chances for you to convert customers just cuz uh, the market is already saturated there fourth one is a discrete strategy it only appeals to customers who find themselves in situations where no or limited alternatives are available um is this a very niche strategy as such this is kind of where you're really trying to identify opportunities that um, essentially have had no alternatives so here's sort of where you're trying to be the first in the market and you're identifying areas where you're sort of like dipping your toes into it and seeing whether is this really a viable strategy or not um again the difference between underserved and overserved industries are sort of where you've identified an opportunities clearly and um there there are areas that 
people have already innovated on but discrete is kind of where you're you're almost sort of going in from scratch and uh, understanding if there's a different way to look at a problem overall and um, where there's no limited uh, alternatives as such sustaining strategies kind of like uh, right in the middle as i'll sort of go back to the entire strategy matrix overall uh, a st st sustaining strategy is essentially making sure that your business is sustaining the growth that it has today while um, the targeting customers that has few very few underserved or overserved needs as such while it usually a poor strategy for new market entrant, of course, because you are trying to sustain something. It's often used by incumbents to retain customers. Um, these can be, uh, for example, a lot of uh, technology companies that are, that have survived over the last couple of decades, uh, be it the Oracles of the world or SAPs of the world. Um, they they might find sustaining strategies to be a lot more. A um, lot more useful in some of the product development that they do in order to ensure that their customer base is retained as such. Um, as I mentioned, SAP as an example, uh, one of the things that they focused on and innovated on is uh, reinventing the wheel on how best to use databases as such. Um, they launched HANA perhaps about a decade ago, uh, which is essentially focusing on an area that is uh, something that's relevant to the market it's perhaps overserved by all the databases overall but it's a sustaining strategy in order to make sure that uh, the, the custom base that they have as part of sap uh, continues to be with them and essentially uses them as sort of their holistic platform um, one of the tenets that we spoke about is sort of customers see a need to do all of their jobs in a single platform. And perhaps SAP saw that as an opportunity where while they provide ERP solutions, having the database aspect of it as part of their suite would be really useful for their customers. And they basically um, sort of focused on that to be their product strategy overall. Um, I sort of want to bring this all back into a circle, as I mentioned. Um, differentiated strategy is kind of where the underserved uh, underserved customers are where you're going after. They want to get the job done better, and you you always have the opportunity to charge more. Um, dominant strategy is where you're winning all types of customers and underserved, overserved, etc. You like you you're going after an area which you think is something. Uh, where you have a strategy that you, you're confident will work overall. Discrete is when you're winning customers with limited options. So a lot of innovation is required there in my mind, um, but it, it is also sort of uh, a risky area for you to be uh, investing in. Disruptive, it sort of speaks for itself where um, there's an overserved opportunity but um, you're trying to disrupt the market with something completely new and completely changing the way the customer looks at the job done. In summary, um, today we spoke about some of the success stories of jobs to be done. Um, as again, I spoke a few um, about a few such as uh, Cordis and DoorDash who have been very successful in focusing on what the customer needs are and really delivering to that. Um, the core tenets of jobs to be done were the nine that we walked through. Um, this is think of them to be a mental framework that you need to be in when before you sort of embark yourself on a journey doing using the research framework. Third is um, jobs to be done mapping canvas, which is essentially a tool or a mechanism that you could use. Again, there are a lot of canvases. I've just taken one as an example and sort of walk you through um, how best you you capture the jobs that the customers are trying to do and are able to iterate on them. And lastly, we spoke about the growth strategy matrix, which is essentially tying all of what you learn from your mapping canvas to the growth strategy of your company. And what are some of the growth strategy uh, growth strategies that you can imply based on what you have learned from your jobs overall? Uh, if you'd like to chat about jobs to be done further or just I want to say hello. Um, that's my email ID along with my LinkedIn. Um, 
feel free to sort of drop me in or uh, drop me a text um i'm also interested in learning more about what else excites you about product management i'd love to sort of see any new opportunities to collaborate on future thank you again this is sudeepta